There we go. Okay, here we go. Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Lovely. Hi, Mary Grace. Hi, Sarah. I hope you guys are doing okay. Um, it is officially 9 o'clock, so we're going to get things moving and shaking. Uh, I've got a uh, probably about two hours is my little girl's birthday, so I got to go out and uh, get some stuff. So, but I hope you guys are doing all right. Uh, the um, uh, welcome to week three. All right, and uh, so today's lecture stuff is on uh, chapters five and chapter six. We're going to be dealing with microbiology basics there for chapter five, and uh, then chapter six we're moving on to other stuff there. Um, but I want you guys to know that the, your first quiz will open up there this afternoon, uh, probably thinking there sometime in the afternoon, um, and it will only be on weeks one and two material, all right? So, uh, we're kind of leapfrogging, and that's generally how this course goes. We'll be, you know, having lecture for one stuff, but then we'll all be testing you on previous stuff there. The, uh, the quiz is about 60 questions, so it's not really a quiz, but it's worth 10%. Okay, so it is a good chunk in here. Everything that we've been working towards is for this reason right here. Uh, the evaluation there, um, the, um, the, I don't know if you guys have done uh, tests or evaluations on Blackboard there before, but you'll just go to the Blackboard folder there will be a testing folder there. You'll click on that, and then um, the test will pop up. You'll see test one or quiz one, and uh, you can open it. And you'll see there that the questions will be a one at a time, okay, and uh, all multiple choice. You can go back. You can stop and start the test. You can, you know, if the uh, you got to take your kids to soccer practice, you st stop the test. It automatically saves it, uh, and then you can go back to it there at a later date. Okay, and everything should be saved. the uh, The questions are randomized. The answers are randomized. Um, I don't think that there is an all. You know, like. Um, you know, uh, answer A, B, and C, and then answer D will be all of the above, or none of the above. I don't think that there is any, uh, but if there are, um, you know, the answers will be randomized, so if it's all of the above is A, really it should be D, and it should mean all other answers. But if there's any issues there, let me know. But uh, the test is very good. It's on weeks one and two. Um, protein synthesis, uh, cell organelles, um, some introductory anatomy physiology, uh, body naming, that kind of stuff. But you remember, this test is not a closed book. It's open book. So you want, it's a PowerPoint based test. Okay. You've read the chapters. You've gone over the PowerPoints. You've watched the videos. You're good to go. All right. And as I said, there's no time limit. Okay, per se, it'll um, the test will close next Tuesday at midnight. Okay, so it'll open there Wednesday in the afternoon, maybe two or three o'clock, somewhere in there, and it'll be open for like six or seven days. However, you know, uh, but next Tuesday midnight it will close. Okay, so you have lots of time. I do not want time to be a factor in this. I want the material to give you trouble, not the stress of taking a test, okay? But please be careful. Sometimes these tests, when they're open and open, and I mean really open like this one, too much time can actually work negatively because you'll start to second-guess yourself, okay? So um, have some fun with this, and this kind of should be fun. You should be having fun. I know it's kind of weird to test, having fun, but this is the... Uh, this is, uh, this is your life, your current life path. You chose this. So hopefully there you enjoy this. And it, it should be a kind of a, a self-discovery. Okay? And uh, yeah, if you have any issues, let me know. Uh, any questions there that don't make sense, shoot me an email. You know what I mean? I'm checking my emails all the time. So let me know if you guys have any trouble there with the test, accessing it, these kinds of things here. But yeah, there we go. Um, if you just joined in, we just talked about the quiz there. 
It'll open up there this afternoon, multiple choice, completely randomized, um, only on weeks one and two. Closes next Tuesday at midnight. So have some fun with that. Um, do you guys have any questions there before we begin? I'm using this as an excuse to have a coffee break. No, you guys are good to go. You know what? I'm proud of you. Keep going. Keep on kicking. You guys are going to do great. And uh, you'll see there that uh, the test, you know, it's like 60 questions, right? So it's not really a quiz, you know, but it's countered by the fact that it is completely open. Be careful of Google. Google can give, uh, you know, you guys know the internet. You can, um, you can find an answer for or against any issue. So just be careful of Google. Stick to the PowerPoint. Stick to your uh, textbook. Okay? And that's where we're at. Uh, oh, Jesse, you have a question? No? If not, if you have a question anytime, just uh, because I'm going to close the screen here or minimize the screen, I won't be able to see. Oh, maybe there is. Uh, is there anything? No, no messages. Okay. If you guys have a question, let me know. But other than that, we're going to get moving. All right. So let me, uh, the week three, chapter five PowerPoint has been updated. So please make sure there that y'all have an updated copy of it. Okay. And let's share the screen. There we go. Perfect. Let's rock and roll. So we, um, here's a uh, microbiology basics. Okay. And you know what I mean? We could spend, you know, a hundred years on every single slide, but it's not the objective of this course. Okay. Uh, we're going to go into some basic microbial, um, uh, terms and identifiers. We'll look at bacteria. We'll look at some viruses, some fungi, uh, just have some fun for sure. But remember, none of this is on the quiz that'll open up there this afternoon. Let's go. We're going to look at disease and infection. We're going to look at a word there like pathogen. Uh, we're going to look at viruses, mushrooms, uh, bacteria, a little bit of staining, um, identifying some types of bacteria. Um, just knowing there that when we're dealing with microorganisms, we can never and will never ever eliminate them from the equation. Okay. They were here billions of years before us. They'll be here billions of years after us. Uh, hopefully there by the end of this PowerPoint, you'll see that how versatile and adaptable these creatures are and why they've, they've been around for billions of years. Uh, the majority of the uh, Earth's oxygen uh, comes from these guys here. We'll have a look. Um, so stopping the spread of infection. If you really want to stop the spread of infection there, Okay, 99% of bacteria are beneficial for us. There's 1% there that are not. But when you're talking about uh, disease and pathogens, hands are the worst. Okay, they come in contact with guardrails, doorknobs, paper money, uh, all these kinds of things which can just be breeding grounds for bugs. And when I, I, I'm going to use the word bugs all day long, I'm not talking six-legged invertebrates like uh, grasshoppers. Okay, I'm talking microorganisms. Okay, just my word there for bugs. Uh, let's go. Um, Louis Pasteur devised this whole idea here of, um, you know, do microorganisms, you know, you know, we can't see them, but there are diseases that are present. And, you know, uh, the whole idea there that science began in the dark ages and they started to investigate what went on. And you see there, uh, Pasteur, uh, boiled some uh, broth, you know, some bones and and uh, water, right? And you make a broth. And you boil it so it's sterilized. And then you uh, take this broth there and you go outside of a building. And 89% of these showed growth. So there's lots of bacteria outside of the house, right? Um, so uh, again, boil some and sterilize some broth. And you walk around the inside of a building and so 32% of these broths demonstrated bacterial growth. Okay, so this is showing us here that there's more bacteria outside than inside. And okay, we know that. 
But, you know, back then they didn't. You know, they didn't even know bacteria really existed. You know, they were just trying to prove that uh, there are things there that we cannot see that are still alive, right? So, you know, you look at the, the whole idea of experimentation and hypothesis here, hypothesis making. Uh, hypothesis A, bacteria arise spontaneously. And hypothesis B, bacteria in the air contaminate a broth. You know, and, uh, you know, you're just trying to prove how these bugs get into our system, get into our food. Do these bugs really exist, right? And we, um, Pasteur uh, exhibited this there in the first experiment. Second experiment there, you have a nutrient broth here, and it's got this curved end to it, okay, where there's, it's not a straight line for the bugs to get in. And you'll see there that this one here, okay, 100% have no growth. These bacteria, they get in here, but they get trapped in here. They can't get up. So, you know, it's just an understanding of the vector nature of these bacteria, how if we are going to get infected or, you know, your food is going to become contaminated, how? And uh, through the air in direct line, okay? The bacteria can't get up here, so this is completely uh, bug-free. I just thought it was interesting there to show that, uh, you know, the, the proof for existence of these microorganisms has been going on for a long time. And we're just starting to learn about them, you know, being able to uh, sequence their DNA, understand their evolutionary processes will help us there predict uh, what's going to go on there for the future. But again, don't ever think that we will ever get rid of these. It's only a matter of controlling, keeping them at bay. The whole point of eliminating them it will never happen. Let's keep going. So a disease, what is a disease? Okay, a failure of the body to function normally. Okay, uh, a pathogen is a disease producing organism. Okay, like the whole idea there that the black plague, you know, uh, from the, you know, the dark ages there, you know, bring out your dead, bring out your dead. You know, that's how many people were dying at this point in time. And as it turns out, it was the fleas on the rats that were housing uh, a bacterium. That's all it was. And the uh, Black Plague is still around today, by the way. Every now and again, you hear about people there that go camping, and a couple of them will get it. Some simple antibiotics uh, um, cleans a person up, but the Black Plague is still around. Uh, an infection, invasion of the body by a pathogen. Uh, you can have localized or systemic. Systemic is just another word for body. Okay, so if you do get an infection, you do want it to be localized, okay, easier to treat. Uh, something, uh, infection becomes more widespread, becomes more difficult to treat. And I thought this was an uh, interesting um, little uh, group of slides here. You'll see that um, here's just a pinhead, okay, bobby pin or whatever, a pin attack. And you see there, you look at it, looks good. Zoom in, oh, zoom in more zoom in more and they're just covered we are covered by our own good bacteria and we got our good bacteria there from our mom okay and just that close proximity there of mom and child there breastfeeding the whole idea you get all of mom's good bacteria and that is your natural flora now uh, the majority of bacteria are good for us okay we'd actually die without bacteria in our large intestine okay um, but there are a lot of bacteria out there, microorganisms that are not good for us. Different kinds of pathogens here. There's bacteria, virus, fungi. We're going we're gonna to look at these three in particular. Okay, but there are protozoa, single-celled creatures there. Um, you hear every once in a while that some kids go swimming in a Florida pond and some kid gets uh, <clears throat> some brain-eating amoeba. Okay, or uh, and these single-celled uh, creatures there that are, that are their own creatures, you know, single-celled. There are worms, okay, um, that can, uh, they're parasitic, they can live in your digestive tract. Uh, there's arthropods as well, mites, ticks, um, the whole idea there, tick disease. Um, you just want to be careful if you're ever walking through the forest or tall grasses, you want to make sure there that you're wearing some type of jeans or pants, okay, to protect yourself. Lyme disease is nothing uh, to sniff at.
Okay, it's very bad disease, and they don't even know a lot about its effects long term. Bacteria, let's get into it here. They are single cell creatures. They have a cell wall, unlike eukaryotes. Okay, last week there we looked at the eukaryotic cell. Okay, um, uh, mammals, uh, higher creatures there were eukaryotic. We have cell membranes, but we don't have a cell wall, right? Trees. They have plants. They have cell walls. Okay. Um, able to form spores. We'll talk more about spores, but spores are these. When times get tough, that's one of the um, that's one of the ways there that these things can you know survive for thousands of years. The whole idea when there's a drought, there's no water, there's no food. These things can shrivel up into a spore. Okay, and this spore can survive for years without any water. Okay, uh, we'll get more into those as we uh, get through the PowerPoint. They're often uh, grouped by shapes and clusters. You'll see there that cocci bacteria, like staphylococci, streptococci, those are round. Okay, we have bacilli. These are rod-shaped, just like the ones there we saw here. These are bacilli, okay, rod-shaped. And then we have spirilia. They're kind of like uh, coils, all right? They're spiraled. There's a lot more different kinds I'll show you there in a bit. So prokaryotes, you know, last week there we looked at eukaryotes, and you'll remember, and I have a slide there that, that, that compares all of these, but you'll see that these prokaryotes, they mean, bef prokaryote means before the nucleus. So you see these bacteria, there's really not much to them. They got a cell wall, they got a cell membrane, you know, cell membranes allow things in and out. Okay, there's your genetic material. They have uh, ribosomes that make protein. That's their only organelle, ribosomes, all right? And so the, there's really not much to these. They'll have a flagella. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. Um, maybe they'll have multiple flagella. But they're, and these are fimbriae here, okay, that are for attaching to surfaces. Uh, there's something called a sex pili, which we'll talk about there later, the... Uh, these guys here, they're so versatile, and they're very, very primitive. And the life cycle of a bacteria, about 20 minutes before it divides. 20 minutes. We'll talk about uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance, uh, all these kinds of things here. No nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles, just ribosomes, okay? So all they can do is make protein. That's it. Uh, unicellular. Uh, no uh, nucleus there, forerunner to eukaryotic cells, okay. Single closed circular chromosome contains, uh, contained with uh, the nucleoid. There's no histones, you know, wrapping of the DNA around. You'll see there that this DNA is circular. That's how it replicates. These guys here are so simple. They, when they want to, uh, when the cell wants to duplic uh, duplicate and double, you know, reproduce, Copies the DNA, starts the starting point, is the uh, same as the ending point. And all of a sudden, you've doubled. That's how versatile these, gar these guys are. There's no point in ever get, trying to get rid of them because they are, life cycle's too short. Their physiology is so simple. They're so adaptive. Like these bacteria can, be, can become um, resistant to antibiotics in 20 minutes. All right, so uh, which is actually uh, proving to be a very uh, a, a tough time there with big pharmaceutical companies there because we're running out of antibiotics. And you think if we run out of antibiotics, we go right back to the 12th century, right? Where cavities killed people. And this is, uh, this is the whole thing. So this is pretty, um, this is pretty serious stuff here. Uh, continuing on here, just another shot, okay, uh, the cell wall um, is composed of what we call peptidoglycan, and the, that is the cell wall, okay, it's one of the major components of the cell wall of bacteria, and also microbially, or sorry, antimicrobially, when you're talking antibiotics there that kill bacteria, that is a major source, these antibiotics will attack this peptidoglycan, which I'll show you there in a little bit. And it, what it does is it breaks a hole in the cell wall and the bacterial contents 
spill out into solution and the bacterium dies. Okay, that's how some of these antibi uh, antibiotics work. Okay, by attacking the peptidoglycan within the cell walls of these bacteria. Um, they only have ribosomes. I said that there earlier uh, when we're talking about uh, organelles. While the eukaryotic cells, we have peroxisome and lysosomes and Golgi apparatus and, you know, uh, rough ER and smooth ER and all these kinds of things, right? Bacteria, no. They have ribosomes. They can make protein. That's it. Okay. They divide by a process there called binary fission. And basically where one bacterium just divides into two. That's it. Copies of DNA. That's it. 20 minutes, you got two bacterium. Another 20 minutes, you got four. Flagella for locomotion, moving around. Okay. Here are the different types of uh, bacteria. You've got uh, round, the uh, cocci, bacilli. Um, you know, there's uh, different ones here. We'll have a look at some of them here. But, you know, cocci, round. You can have diplococci. These guys uh, hang out in, in, in uh, pairs. Okay. Uh, you've got staphylococci, which is in bunches. This one here, be very, very careful. Staph infections, they can go from mild to ferocious in a matter of 24 hours. So a staph infection, do not ever take them lightly. Okay. Uh, so staph means bunches. Strep means line. So here we have uh, streptococci. Okay. Uh, bacilli, these are these rod-shaped. Okay, diplobacilli, streptobacilli, there's that strep, it's in chains. Um, you know, you've got vibrio, which kind of looks like a kidney. Um, there's your uh, spiroche, like this. So, you know what I mean, we'll hit those three. There might be a question or two on the next quiz. Okay. Uh, just some different shots there. There's your uh, spiroche, there's your streptococci, strep is in chains, cocci is round, here's E. coli, you'll see there, it's shaped there, bacillus. Differences there, some similarities between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, um, they contain all four biological molecules, uh, lipids, fats, uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids, they have the same stuff there that we do, uh, they have ribosomes for protein synthesis, they have DNA, now, theirs is very uh, simplistic, okay? They have uh, the genomic DNA, which is in a circle, but then they also have these little ones here called plasmids, and they're also little circles. And they have, it's quite revolutionary. They have these little circles of DNA that they can exchange between each other. You know what I mean? They can talk to each other, where if one bacteria is resistant to a particular type of antibiotic, well... It just talks to another bacterium, not even of the same species. It can exchange genetic material. So that bacterium now, within 20 minutes, is now resistant. Scary stuff. Uh, can be unicellular. Um, and they both have plasma membranes, right? The whole point of a plasma membrane is to let things in and out, right? That you want. And uh, this uh, slide here, you can zoom in, zoom out to compare. And this is kind of why I like this screen like this. It's kind of like uh, manipulatable during a presentation, right? So you have a look here. This is, the, this is us. This is a eukaryote, okay? We've seen this kind of a slide there before. You see all the different organelles, mitochondria, uh, rough ER. There are the ribosomes studying it there, the Golgi apparatus. You see what's going on here, okay? And uh, Golgi apparatus there. This is your smooth endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, all these kinds of things here, okay? Now, zoom out. And here's a bacterium that we just saw. All right, pretty simplistic. But it, it, it's that simplicity that makes it so dangerous, okay? Can't ever expect to get rid of these things. Okay, so let's, uh, why can't I, my screen is frozen, there we go, perfect. Let's get rid of that one, and just have a look here, this is plants, and you can see a, there are some similarities that go on, right? Uh, you'll see there that they have, there's your nucleus, 
You have chloroplasts. These kind of look like mitochondria. Huh, interesting. Uh, but they do have mitochondria here as well. You know, and uh, have a look at those, and it's just a good little comparison. All right. There are lots of similarities between the three. Okay. Bacterial DNA. Okay, there's two kinds, as I kind of alluded to already. You have the genomic, and you see there it's just a circle. This is the bigger one there that's going on. That's this one in here, just a circle. So you'll see for replication purposes, it's so easy. But then it also has these little ones called plasmids. The bacterial DNA, the genomic, never leaves the bacterium, but these guys here, these are the ones that encode for antibacterial, uh, you know, um, resistance you know to our drugs and these can be readily shared between bacterium of different species of the same species and exchanging a material okay so um, inside the bacterial cytoplasm houses the bacterial DNA there's genomic there's plasmid okay we utilize these in genetic engineering what we do it could be because these are highly versatile genetic uh, pieces of uh, DNA that you know, we can move around, we can augment, we can change, we can insert, delete our own stuff. And, you know, th there are a lot of benefits for this. When you're talking biotechnology, where we now, if we can put in our own DNA, we can tell this bacteria to do something. And that's what we've done. We can um, insert there the information there to, uh, to produce insulin. And we inject this there into, into these bacterium. So now these bacterium, we, you know... We house them in these big tanks, you know, kind of similar to making beer or wine. And uh, we put all these bacteria in there. These bacteria have been reprogrammed there to produce insulin because we've altered their DNA to do it. And now all these bacteria are producing insulin. We extract the insulin and uh, give it to people there who need it. So there, there are benefits there, okay? Um Bacterial genetic material can be exchanged between bacteria. It can be altered. So while our DNA can't be changed, you know, it is what it is, you know, only through mutation, you know, smoking or drinking, cancer-causing agents, the, you know, that's how our bacteria can be changed. But we don't want it to be changed like that, right? But bacteria, their DNA can be changed, altered, moved around, you know, and that's what makes them so dangerous. Uh, there's transposition. This is where the bacteria naturally moves genomic DNA back and forth from the plasmid DNA and back and forth. So this DNA doesn't leave the bacteria. This one here can, but it can, it, so it can move information from here to here and back and forth as needed. Because if this inf information in the genomic DNA can't get out, well, then it'll just move it over here to the plasmids, and then these plasmids, which carry that information there that you wanted, now we can export that to other bacteria. Bananas, really. So that's called transposition, the moving of information between genomic and plasmid DNA. Uh, there's something called conjugation, and you'll see it here in the electron micrograph here. By using uh, bacteria, have what's called a sex pilus, sex pili, okay? And between bacterium of their own species or not, they can join and exchange those plasmids. They can talk to each other, exchange genetic information. Crazy, eh? Uh, there is transformation. Bacteria can undergo transformation when they incorporate DNA from their environment. So a, DNA, uh, a bacteria can just, you know, you've got bacterium in a, in a Petri dish. You know, they're sitting in their, uh, their uh, you know, what we call nutrient agar. That's where they live and they extract energy and food from it, right? It's their food source, their home. If we put DNA into their food, their food supply, they can, hey, that's some good DNA. I'm going to take it. They can alter their own DNA. They can pick DNA up in their environment and incorporate it into their own DNA. So they can alter their DNA whenever they want. Um, there's something there called a bacteriophage. This is a virus that only infects bacteria. And you see the, uh, what happens there. And I'll show you what, uh, how a uh, virus works. It lands on a cell 
and injects its genetic material into the cell and thereby altering the cell. And um, that's, uh, so these bacteriophages, they're viruses that affect bacteria only. They transmit their viral DNA uh, from one bacterial cell to another through the process there called transduction. Okay, so uh, there are some good movies there. I'm not going to play them here. Just uh, YouTube will uh, get after you. So have a look at those movies. Pause the videos there if you're watching this there after the fact and give those movies a little watch. Okay. Bacteria can divide through binary fission, and you'll see there the prokaryotic DNA. There's your plasma membrane and your cell wall. Duplication of the chromosomes. Okay, as I said, it's a very simple process where the starting point is the same as the end point. Okay, and then you'll see the pinching off of the two cells, and it's as simple as that. That's how these guys divide. Okay, bacterium, um, you know, there's uh, fungi, you know, um, uh, different ways there that they divide. We'll talk about those there at a later date. Uh, but here we go. Binary fission. Very simple process. Optimal microbial growth. I'm not really too uh, interested in the specifics, but I just wanted to show you there that um, these bacterium, they divide very quickly. Their, ge their genes are very simple. They don't have a lot of organelles to carry around like we do. They're very simple, and not only are they so simple and adaptive, look at, there's a wide range of bacterium that basically cover all different temperatures. There are bacterium there that, uh, these are the psychrophiles there, they're happy in and around 8, 9 degrees. And where do you see that? In your refrigerator. You've got uh, psychrotrophs in and around 22 degrees. 23, 21 degrees, room temperature, mesophiles, now you're into the high 30s. These guys here are happy in the high 30s. You've got thermophiles here, okay, that are happy in the 60s. And hyperthermophiles, now you're talking there at the bottom of the ocean in these ocean vents, okay. Um, and look, you're almost, you're superseding there the boiling point of water, which should disrupt you know, that water is boiling, and, you know, boiling water, that will disrupt cell membranes, that'll break apart everything, right? The whole idea of boiling a vegetable, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're destroying all those cells, right? You're burst, you're bursting them all. Well, and look, these bacteria, they're okay at that temperature. It's crazy, okay? Um, optimal microbial ox uh, oxygen concentration. Some of these bacteria there, they thrive in the presence of oxygen. Some of them do not. And uh, you've got obligate aerobes. These ones here are absolutely dependent on atmospheric oxygen. And you'll see there that these guys in a test tube environment, if you close it off, these guys are uh, striving for oxygen. Okay. Uh, you've got facultative anaerobes. Uh, they don't require oxygen for growth, but grow better in its presence. So you see all these bacterium, you know, they're kind of indifferent to oxygen, you know, have it or not, but the, in the, if, if oxygen is present, they'll grow better in it. Facultative anaerobes, you've got aerotolerant anaerobes here that are absolutely indifferent to oxygen, don't care if it's there, don't care if it's not, and then you've got obligate anaerobes here that do not tolerate oxygen at all, okay? Um, so... They, these things, these bacteria are so versatile, they, at any temperature, lots of different pHs, some of them like acidic pH, some of them like basic pH, some of them like oxygen, don't, they're all over the place, don't even think about getting rid of them, you just have to learn to live with them, okay? Um, bacterial endospores, Okay, under harsh conditions, you know, uh, in drought or heat or all these kinds of things there, when it's not really conducive for bacterial growth, these things will revert back into this spore form. Okay, and we call these their endospores. It's this um, spore coat. It be basically becomes impenetrable. Okay, like these things are so small, so you can step on them. It doesn't matter. They don't, you know, you can't destroy them. The only way that we can really get rid of them is in an autoclave, which is, you know, a big, huge, they use them at hospitals there. It's basically a big pressure cooker where you jack up the temperature and you jack up the pressure, right? And you put in, you know, like a pressure cooker, you put in a cheap piece of meat 
And in an hour or so, it's so much pressure and heat there inside there, you've broken that down. It resembles, you know, five hours of cooking in a normal stove. Well, that's what we have to do to get rid of these guys. Because each one of these is a bacterium. So if the, and if the conditions ever do arise where, you know, it's conducive to bacterial growth, these guys, and if these guys are present, they'll germinate. And you've got a bacterium. And in 20 minutes, you'll have two. Another 20 minutes, you'll have four. In an hour, you'll have eight. And then these guys will start multiplying geometrically. That's how bacterial growth goes. Okay, so within 24 hours, you've got thousands. Okay, so um, those are bacterial endospores in a nutshell. Uh, just some different shots there of endospores there. Uh, the nicest one here that I like to look at is, you know, there's your bacterium, your bacillus, your rod shape, and then you can see the spores in there behind. They've been staying differently. There they are, okay? Um, they're very difficult to kill with heat or chemicals. There's your autoclave, okay, your big pressure cooker. You've got to jack things up to 121 degrees Celsius, so way past boiling, and you have to increase the pressure. 101.3 is normal atmospheric pressure. So you've got to kick that pressure up to greater than normal atmospheric pressure to uh, lice or break these cells. Okay. Hmm. Perfect. Hope this is interesting. <laughs> um, here's just a shot of the, uh, remember we were talking about peptidoglycan? The whole idea there of these cell walls of the bacteria, right? It's just there for protection. It's all it is, right? And then one of the main components there is what we call peptidoglycan, also called murin. Okay, um, it's a macromolecule, a macromolecule polysaccharide repeating sugar units. Okay, and it's just cross-linking there with amino acids. Okay, it just provides that toughness. Okay, but this is a major source there for uh, antibiotics there to attack. Okay, and you have to think antibiotics they originally came from mushrooms, fungi. So bacteria and fungi have been arch enemies for billions of years. And the uh, certain antibiotics work by inhibiting the cell wall synthesis. So breaking apart the cell wall, and that's penicillin. Okay, it attacks peptidoglycan, breaks that cell wall open so that the bacterium dies. Okay, um, but is also a source there for antimicrobial resistance. Every time a doctor gives out antibiotics to kill a viral infection. You got a virus. You go into the doctor and doctor gives you antibiotics. Why is the doctor giving you antibiotics? Antibiotics kill bacteria only. They don't kill mushrooms. They don't kill viruses. So why is this doctor giving antibiotics? I have no idea because it's just needless exposure of antibiotics to bacteria and you're just asking these bacteria to become resistant. And they are. Back when I was your age there, there was, uh, you know, there still is a hierarchy of antibiotics. Vancomycin being the highest and greatest and strongest of them all. Back when I was your age there, vancomycin killed everything. It does not anymore. You want to Google there about a bug there called MRSA, M-R-S-A. Okay, flesh-eating bacteria, these ones here. They are res resistant, and once you get it, doctor goes, hey, I hope you make it. Yeah, it's a bad one. Uh, and, then, and if we run out of antibiotics, as I said there earlier, we're going back to the 12th century, and that's a pretty scary place. So, uh, you know, knowledge is power. Uh, staining bacteria. You guys can watch this movie here. Uh, the Basically, what we're looking at is... Um, uh, we can stain bacteria to identify it because that's the first, you know, the whole idea of doing a swab and sending it to the lab. The lab, you know, um, examines it and determines what bug you have. Well, it's all based on the, um, uh, not the membrane, but the cell wall. Okay. And some bacteria will stain what we call uh, gram positive bacteria will stain purple. Gram negative will stain red. And it's all based on their cell wall. And I'm, I'm not going to test you on this, but I just, I, you know, the whole idea of explaining to you there, watch the movie. The movie 
is a great little movie. It goes into the whole idea there of what gram staining is and identifying, okay, uh, different kinds of bacteria. But it's all based on their different cell walls. And you'll see there that gram positive bacteria, the cell wall has a thick peptidoglycan layer, okay? Very thick peptidoglycan layer. That's this blue layer, right? Gram negative bacteria, they have a thin peptidoglycan layer, okay? Uh, there's another kind of bacteria called mycobacterium there, and you can see it's quite different as well. All right, so we can stain according to their different cell walls, and it's just a way for us to identify what type of infection you have. Okay, um, bacterial nutrition some bacteria live separately, and others remain together in, uh, to form uh, colonies. And you'll see there that when you do take a swab of your throat and send this there to the lab, the lab tech there takes that swab and kind of swabs it there on a microbial plate. And you can see there that after 24 hours or so, you get these little colonies. And what this means is, is that there was one bacteria, well, right, right here, there was one bacteria doubled, doubled, doubled. This whole thing came from one bug. This came from one bug. You can see here how many, there were three bacterium here originally when the person swabbed the plate. And you'll see it grew from here, here, here. So this is how we identify these bacterium there by these colonies, okay? And some bacteria like to live with other ones. Some bacteria live by themselves. Um, there are bacteria that live as parasites, which uh, they absorb food materials there from other living uh, organisms called their host, okay? Uh, others digest and absorb food materials there from dead organisms. These bacteria are called saprophytes. You'll see that word again when you're talking about mushrooms, okay? Uh, they have, um, and, and that's the thing with bacteria, they are decomposers. You know, we die, we go into the ground. Our body becomes decomposed. We need these bacteria to recycle, to break down um, the energy there in dead animals, dead organisms, and bring that energy back into Mother Earth. Okay? They're important. Our world wouldn't survive without them. Uh, most bacteria are indeed beneficial. Uh, there's that decomposers word there. All right? Uh, many bacteria are used there to produce food and life-saving drugs. We use bacteria there to make cheese, pickles, yogurt, vinegar, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, beer, wine, all these kinds of things. Okay, and as I said there, insulin. This is there the, just the method there of um, what we call genetic engineering uh, by using methods of gene transplanting. So taking the gene, the code for insulin production, and in putting it into one of those plasmid DNA and putting that into a bacteria, that bacteria will start making insulin. Okay? Crazy stuff, eh? This is the future. The human intestinal tract contains millions of bacteria. Oh, yeah. And you, ha you should be eating yogurt every day. It doesn't have to be the great expensive probiotic yogurt there. Um, you know, I see yogurt tubs for like $7 there at the supermarket. Ridiculous. Just cheap yogurt. And it has your, uh, all the bacteria you don't need probiotic. Yogurt is probiotic. Okay. And your colon is completely lined with good bacteria. And you want that. Okay. Because those bacteria, they break down stuff there that we need. Provide us there with vitamin K. They provide us with all these different nutrients. And the, one of the problems there with antibiotics, taking them needlessly, is that you take antibiotics, it completely wipes your colon clean, it gets rid of all those bacteria. So now your colon is just a bare wall. And you don't want that because if your colon has bare spots, back, bad bacteria can get in there and nestle right in, right? So you want to maintain a healthy gut flora. Okay, um, many bacteria are pathogenic though, okay, I think 99% are okay for our non-pathogenic, but 1% are. Uh, pathogen is an organism there that causes disease or infection. Some bacterial diseases of humans are tuberculosis, very bad one. Uh, tetanus, 
uh, strep throat, all these different ones here. Uh, they bacteria in large numbers can pollute. Okay, lake streams, drinking water. Okay, during respiration, bacteria reduce the dissolved oxygen content in water supplies. Make it difficult there for fish. If there's too much bacteria in the water, they'll rob the water of oxygen. Fish will die. Uh, Helicobacter pylori, also known as H. pylori, the whole idea of getting uh, an ulcer. They used to think that it was caused by drinking, smoking, eating spicy food. But really, as it turns out, it's just a bacterium that lines the gut of the stomach and uh, produces a, and makes a hole in the stomach. Not a good one. Okay, so many bacteria and viruses uh, can survive low pH of the stomach. Uh, H. pylori lives in the stomach under the mucus layer. After many, oh, after many years, they can cause sores called ulcers in the lining of the stomach. Uh, for some people, an infection can lead to stomach cancer. Okay, yeah, it's quite serious, but... With some uh, antibiotics, you can get rid of that ulcer, not a problem. Harmful anaerobic bacteria. Aerobic is oxygen breathing. Anaerobic is not, right? So um, two other anaerobic bacteria can cause venereal disease. There's gonorrhea, if left long enough, can cause sterility. Syphilis there can result in death many years on from onset. Uh, a venereal disease is a contagious disease that a person gets through sexual contact. Both diseases can be treated successfully with antibiotics if detected early enough. Okay, uh, botulism. This is a bad one. If you um, if you have any canned food, okay, when you open up that can, you know you put the can opener on it and it goes, psh, you know, like you're opening up a bottle of Coca Cola or something, you know, that uh, carbon dioxide. But if you open up a can and it goes, psh. Like there was a trapped gas inside and now it just escaped. You just want to take that can and put it in the bin. Okay? Because uh, that means that there's been bacteria in there and they, they were uh, producing a gas inside. If the can is kind of distorted or bloated looking, you don't even want to really open it. Just put it in the bin. This is botulism, a dangerous type of food poisoning. Uh, yeah, it's a bad one. Okay? Uh, bacterial diseases in humans there. Nice little recap slide. There's your sexually transmitted diseases. Um, respiratory diseases. Okay, skin diseases. Digestive tract, nervous system. All of these. Okay, and uh, yeah, just be careful. Knowledge is power. Where you guys are going, you might encounter some of these. Okay, protect yourself, protect yourself, protect yourself, right? That's why we wear gloves in our hands. When you're working in the medical field, you never touch your hands to your face. Okay. Uh, cell death, apoptosis, and infarction. Uh, there's uh, great words here. Apoptosis, which we'll get into more later, but I just wanted to let you know that it is what we call programmed cell death. Our skin cells are born to die in about four weeks. Okay. Programmed cell death acts as a protective mechanism. is a continuous process. Infarction. This is not programmed cell death. And if you look at the word here, myocardial infarction. Myocardial, here we're talking heart muscle, death. Heart cell death. Viruses. A virus is not a cell. It is made up of genetic material inside. A virus is, is now you're, you want to get into more simple, you know, um, creatures. Virus is about as simple as it gets. We don't even know if this thing's alive. All it all basically is is just an empty ball with some genetic material inside. It can be DNA, can be RNA. Remember, RNA is that flimsy paper bag copy of the DNA, and that's all they got. These things here have been around for billions of years, too. There's not much to them at all, and that's what makes them even more deadly. Okay? Um... Viruses consist of DNA or RNA there within a protein shell. Viruses reproduce only within a host. Bacteria, they only have ribosomes. Viruses, they got nothing. They don't have any organelles. They don't have anything. The only thing there that they can do is you'll see they land on a cell and you see the genetic information inside here, the capsid protein. They just inject that information, that DNA or genetic material into the host cell and then all of a sudden that host cell now stops working for the host and starts working for the virus. 
and the virus utilizes that cell's organelles to make more virus. True parasite right here. Viruses, we can crystallize them, freeze them, and they come right back. So we don't even know if they're what we call acellular. We don't even know if they're alive. Uh, they can only reproduce inside a living cell called the host cell. Outside the host cell, a virus is lifeless and often exists as a crystal. If it's not in solution, it's just a dried out crystal. That once it can get inside a body or get inside of a cell, uh, you know, land on a cell, then it'll do what it needs to do. Has no means of locomotion. Is this thing alive? He used to say. So just a, a relative shot here, comparison analysis. This is a eukaryotic cell. This is us. There's your bacterium, okay, your prokaryotic, and there's a virus. So a virus can land on here. It can land on here and do its dirty work. Negative virus influences. They can cause infection in both plants and animals. Some viruses cause tumors and warts. Okay, uh, polio, measles, mumps, influenza, hepatitis, colds, AIDS, okay, uh, and HPV, okay. This one here, uh, the whole idea of getting warts, genital warts, they realize there the people who, who have this virus, they have a higher chance of, uh, you know, cervical cancer and different kinds of cancer, okay. Uh, there's your HPV virus there for warts, influenza virus, flu, rabies virus, and there is your uh, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, okay? Uh, viral diseases in humans sexually transmitted, okay? Uh, childhood diseases, mumps, measles, chicken pops, respiratory diseases, okay, SARS, flu, skin diseases, warts, shingles is a bad one there, okay? Digestive tract disease, uh, diarrhea, uh, nervous system, have a look at those. There might be a question on any one of those there for quiz two. Arthropods and worms. You know, I don't really go into too much detail in these there, but the worms there can be round or flat. Transmission by the fecal oral route. Okay. A dog uh, licks its rump. Okay. The eggs from the rump. Okay. That the, a worm gets inside and goes to the digestive tract. It's parasitically feeding off of, you know, what the dog eats. And then the worm will lay eggs. Those eggs will go out the rump. And then the dog will lick its rump. And the eggs will go back in and the whole cycle continues. Right? There are these creatures there that design their whole life cycle based on animals and what they do. Their habits. Arthropods. These are animals there with jointed legs, ectoparasites, vectors. I'm not too worried about these ones here. As I said, we're going after bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Uh, fungal attributes here. Okay, they are eukaryotic, the same as us. Okay, uh, they have a nucleus. Okay, so that's how we know that they are older on the evolutionary chain. Bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. They are earlier, older. Um, most of these guys here are multicellular, okay, and they exist in the, fi in the form of what we call a hyphae. Some are unicellular, that's uh, like yeast, okay. Uh, they're heterotrophic, they can't make their own food, okay. Bacteria can be hetero or autotrophic, okay, but uh, fungi, they're heterotrophic, they, they do not make their own food. They don't have a flagella, they're really not mobile, uh, they're saprozoic. You remember that word there from earlier, absorb dead material. You'll never see a fungi growing on a living organism, okay? Uh, lichen, you'll see lichen on a rock, that fuzzy, furry stuff there. It's just a combination of fungi and algae living uh, symbiotically together. Uh, has powerful hydrolytic enzymes there. It can convert carbs into sugars. Uh, the cell wall, you remember there with bacteria, the cell wall was composed of peptidoglycan. Well, the cell walls of mushrooms are composed of chitin, okay, which is an amino sugar polysaccharide also found in arthropod exoskeletons, okay, so very tough. Fungal structures here, okay, the whole idea of actually seeing a mushroom, that just means there that these mushrooms are at the end of their life cycle. 
The majority of mushroom life cycle occurs underground, okay, in what we call mycelium, okay, mycelial network, okay, and you'll see how these guys go here. These are these hyphae. And again, I'm not going, a lot of this stuff here is pretty, you know, um, intricate, but, you know, how much can I really ask you on a test, right? And uh, so just enjoy. Uh, histoplasma capsulatum. Is a diform, uh, dimorphic fungus there that grows in soil exposed to bird feces or bat feces. Okay, up here in the top left, it can change form to survive at different temperatures. This one here is a bad one because you have to think the lungs, they're dark, they're warm, and they're moist. You couldn't ask for a better place for a fungi to grow, right? These guys here get into the lungs, the spores will get in, in the outdoors there typically grows as mycelium, okay, within the soil, but when the spores are inhaled, it responds there to the high internal temperature of the body by turning into a yeast that can multiply in the lungs, causing chronic lung disease. Chronic, you do not want a chronic lung disease, okay, that is forever, okay. Uh, controlling microorganisms, the definitions there. The, you look at these words here, sterilization, disinfection, sanitation. They kind of mean the same thing, but not really. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to eliminate all microorganisms from an object. You know, if you want to, um, uh, you know, you want to use a spoon to eat your cereal. Well, you need to clean it. Now, clean is clean, clean. Uh huh. What does clean mean? The whole idea there that um, you know uh, you watch commercials there, and do you need a pine saw? Do you need a chemical smell in order to have a desk surface clean? Do you really need that? What is clean? So you have a look here. Uh, sterilization, the process by which all living cells, viable spores, and viruses are removed, destroyed from a surface. So sterilization, that's the removal of everything. You can now perform surgery if needed. Sterilization, nothing. Disinfection, the killing, inhibition, or removal of microorganisms that may cause disease, okay, usually substantially reduces the total microbial population. So this, you're not killing them all, but you're reducing, okay. Sanitation, you walk into a bathroom and there's a sign there that says it's just been recently sanitized. Closely related to disinfection, microbial population is reduced to a level considered to be safe by public health standards. So, sanitized. You've just removed some of the bacteria to a publicly safe level of existence. Interesting. Uh, controlling harmful bacteria, antiseptics, disinfectants, and antibiotics are used to control pathogenic bacteria. An antibiotic is a chemical there that can stop the growth of some bacteria. A bacteria are able to produce types that are resistant to certain antibiotics. When this happens, new antibiotics must be developed. And this is where we're at now. We're in big trouble. We're running behind. Because all of a sudden, if one of these, these uh, simple bacteria develops resistance, man, we're in big trouble. Controlling uh, harmful bacteria, there's pasteurization where we heat the liquid or milk or apple juice up to 70 degrees Celsius, and in theory, it kills 99% of the bacteria. Canning, preser uh, chemical preservation, salting food, okay, radiation, gamma rays, steam or pressure, there's your salt curing, dehydration, all different ways of maintaining uh, or uh, controlling bacteria in our food. Um, development of antibiotic resistance. This is a great slide for detailing how quickly things can change in the fight against bacteria. So here you have um, you have a colony here, and the majority of them there are not drug resistant. But you know, through mutation, it does happen. Okay, and so here we've got two bugs here, two colonies there that are drug resistant. These ones here we're watching. Now, if a doctor gives you antibiotics needlessly, which is what a lot of doctors do, you know, when you have a viral infection, here, take some antibiotics. It doesn't do anything. 
And you see, if we give, the doctor gives you antibiotics, what the antibiotics does is it wipes out all of these other bugs. So that in 48 hours, look what's left. Yeah, not good, not good. So you guys are aware, soon you guys will be practicing medical practitioners. You know this, help people. Physical control of bacteria, there's heat, of course, fire, low temperature, be very careful. This does not kill bacteria, generally speaking. It just controls the microorganisms because once we take them out of the freezer, they just start to grow back again. Filtration is very effective, 100% uh, removal, okay, of uh, microorganisms. Radiation is also very effective at controlling micro microbial growth. The spread of infections, there are portals of entry. We have lots of holes in us, lots of ways for uh, bugs to get in. Respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, uh, the, genita the genital and urinary tract, okay, eyes. Okay, even though we have eyes, that's a hole in our head, nose, skin, uh, you know, just the whole idea. So we, you have to be aware of these ways that bacteria can get in, microorganisms can get in. Um, portals of exit. Now remember the whole idea there when you're talking parasites, worms, viruses, they want to get in, but then they got to get out as well, right? So there are portals of exit. Respiratory tract, uh, gastrointestinal tract, genital urinary tract, eye, skin, breast, just different ways there for these uh, guys to get out, okay? And last slide there, okay, modes of transmission, person to person, close contact, right? You remember the two meter rule? It, you know, when we talk, we spit, but generally that spit flies out and then drops before two meters, so there's no transmission. Uh, environment to person, okay, tiny animals to person, there's all these different ways, but 90% of infections are picked up through hands. So please, alcohol your hands all the time, wash your hands all the time. When your kids come home from school, make sure that they clean their hands because they've been, you know, what kids do at school, you know, and then they come home and give you a hug and you've got it. So just take care of yourself. And I always say there, the whole idea of being a good parent, if you're in an airplane there and the cabin pressure drops and the masks come down, being a good parent, your instinct there is to go and put that mask on your child first because you love your child more, you know. But you don't do that because by the time it takes you to do that, you'll both be un unconscious, okay? You've got to protect yourself. Put your mask on first, protect yourself, and then you're able to protect others, okay? That's welcome to medicine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys are all right. I'm going to stop recording and what time is it now? It is officially 10 o'clock. Let's see you guys back here at 10.15, okay? And, uh, yeah, make it, t yeah, 10, 15 works and we'll see you guys and, uh, we'll continue there with the second PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, any questions? Everyone's good. Okay. Everyone take it easy and we'll see you in, uh, about 12 minutes or so.